choir. This, uh, so last week we started a new series and, it was, and we're looking at, uh, we're talking about revival and what it means to bring revitalization back to, to not just our church but to our, to our own souls and, and to the culture in which we live. And, and, we're, and if you, it, speaking of the NFL draft, <laughs> if you were going to draft uh, a revivalist in the first round, I mean, John Wesley is going to go first, and I think it's important. Uh, I mean, who, who else would make the draft? You know, like Billy Graham and Billy Sunday and, and uh, maybe Martin Luther and uh, Charles Wesley, John's brother. Uh, there would be some amazing people, but John Wesley is definitely going to go in the first round and maybe the top five picks. The reason is because the revival that the, uh, of the, the Methodist revival, the Wesleyan revival, lasted 180 years. And many, many of us are a, a product, a direct product of, of that revival. It, for, for a 50-year period, I told you last week, a 50-year period, they started an average of one church a day for 50 years. By the way, in the last three years, we've closed one church a day. One, one in three persons, at, at a t there was a time in Methodist history where one in three persons in America would have considered, would counted themselves among the Methodists. The, the Methodist church, the EUB church, the, the Evangelical church, the Missionary Alliance, the Free Methodist, the African Methodist, the Nazarene church, the Wesleyan church, the Salvation Army, and the Assemblies of God, to name a few, are all churches that are products of the Wesleyan revival that lasted 180 years. What was it, what compelled John Wesley to, to travel over 250,000 miles by horseback, not by Buick, you know, by horseback, to preach 40,000 sermons in his lifetime, an average of three sermons a day in his adult life. What, 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 what led to that? What were the precursors to that kind of revival? And uh, that's what we began looking at last week. And remember, this, this series is based on uh, Jesus' words in Revelation to John when he speaks to the church in Ephesus. He says this, I admire your toil. I admire your patience and endurance. But, but I have this against you. You have lost your first love. Repent, turn, and go back to the things you did at first. If we want revival, just like Jesus was saying to the church in Ephesus, if you want revival, it's important that you go back and do the things that you did at first. So we want to remember what was it, what was our first love as, as the people called Methodists? Uh, last week we talked about one of the precursors to revival was Wesley's own Catholic spirit, small c, Catholic, which means wide-reaching or wide-ranging spirit. That for John, for John, it was very important that, uh, that uh, you know, if you love Jesus and I love Jesus, then we can work together. It doesn't matter if you're Presbyterian or, or Puritan or, or Orthodox or Catholic or Church of England. It, if you love Jesus and I love Jesus, I can learn from you and you can learn from me. And we, the, the, you know, you don't, we don't have to hate each other to be Christian, <laughs> you know. We can actually love each other. He embraced this universal, wide-ranging spirit that if you're... Uh, he, one of the things he said in his sermon uh, called the Catholic spirit, he said this, though we may not all think alike, may we not love alike? You know, you may, you may have an opinion about uh, infant baptism. You may think a, a, child, a child should be sprinkled or poured on or immersed. Or you may think we shouldn't baptize children at all. We should wait till they're adults. He says that even though we may not think alike, if, we, if you love Jesus, if we have the same heart for Jesus, can, can we not work together? This was the spirit of the Methodist revival. He broke the mold of people that were feuding over, over denominationalism. And then he, said, he, took that, he took that sermon from the scripture verse in 2 Samuel where he said this, If your heart is of my heart, then take my hand. That's the people called Methodists. If your heart is of my heart, take, take my hand. I want to look at another precursor to revival, but before I do that, I got to tell you something that's just exciting that happened to me this week, okay? Not my moped accident, but instead, I wanted to introduce you to my prom date from senior prom. Can we look at the, there you, yeah, I was pretty, I was pretty dabber back then. Let's see that, I had hair like Eric Horn. Yeah, good hair, I looked awesome, and I had, my mom made that cummerbund, and uh, this, the reason I want to introduce you to her, because this, this is Heather Van Norman. Now, Heather and I were friends all the way through grade school. You know, I'm, my last name's Vanderwerf. Hers is Van Norman, so our lockers are always next to each other. She was a, she was, she had a, she was a daughter of adoptive parents. My, my younger brother's adopted, and so our families were kind of close because of that mutual commonality. But this is why I really want you to know Heather, Heather Van Norman. You know, she, uh, uh, next slide, please. Yeah, there she is right there. Her son 
went in the first round. His name is Adele Beckham Jr. He went in the first round of the NFL draft this week. Number 12, pick number 12 to the New York Giants. He's a wide receiver. Now it's no surprise, so that makes me special, right? Because I know somebody and, uh, who has a son who's a New York Giant and is going to make 10 to 12 million dollars a year. So, what, but what, but it's no surprise, anybody from Wyndham, this is no surprise, that Heather Van Norman would have a son who's a pro athlete because Heather, since the eighth grade, she won the 100, 200, and 400. She broke state records in eighth grade in those sprints. And she did so in the ninth grade, and the 10th grade, and the 11th grade, and 12th grade. She thinks she still holds the state titles for those. She went on, she went on to the University of Minnesota and broke college records. She transferred to Louisiana State University where she broke all sorts of college and state records in that, in that state as well. And uh, so no surprise that her son would be really, really fast and able to be a pro athlete. But I imagine it takes more than just good genes to be a pro athlete, right? It, takes, it probably takes discipline. And when I, I didn't recognize Heather in this picture because uh, look at her biceps. <laughs> I mean, she's always been faster than me, but I always thought I could take her in a fight. And I fight dirty, and I think she could still beat me, you know? And she, uh, so you know that uh, Heather has modeled a disciplined life, at least when it comes to weight training. And uh, no wonder, no wonder her son went in the first round of the draft. Well, I wanted to share that with you, but to tell you about the importance of both, uh, both our genes, but mostly the importance of daily discipline in our parents. And I wanted to introduce you to another woman today as we talk about the Methodist revival, the mother of John Wesley. If you, if you remember, John Wesley was born in 1703, about 300 years ago. Uh, to, to the 15, he was the 15th of, the, of 19 children to Samuel and Susanna Wesley. He, uh, a little bit about his father Samuel before I get to his mom. Samuel was a priest who served at St. Andrew's Church of England in Epworth. Now, he was not particularly well-liked there. He was strict. Uh, he had political leanings that supported the kings, and the working class at Epworth did not particularly like that. So two times they tried to, uh, at least uh, two times his rectory burned down. At least one time it was started by the congregation. Okay, so lay off. Because I, I <laughs> but, but, you know, what comes to me, I'm giving back. I got friends in the NFL. All right? Okay, so, so uh, can you, but he stayed at that place. He stayed in that ministry for 39 years, even though they tried to burn his house down. He stayed in that ministry for 39 years, so you can see the tenacity of his father. Uh, uh, okay, Samuel at times was, had gone on long spells away from home due to work, and on a few occasions because he did not handle his finances particularly well, and so he was sent to debtor's prison. So he, he was very intelligent. Uh, the children learned, uh, Charles and John, and, and the rest of the kids learned much from him, from their father, from bi the biblical languages they learned, theology, and just observing him in ministry, they learned much from him. But the biggest influence in the founder of the Methodist movement's faith was his own mother, Susanna. Susanna Wesley was a beautiful, smart woman and the daughter of a popular Puritan priest in London. Her own father insisted that uh, she receive a classical education, which was unheard of for women in the 1600s. So she was a writer and a thinker and a theologian in her own right, and she raised the children. She homeschooled them. She made sure that they received a classical education and uh, learning Latin and Greek. She taught them Latin and Greek, and she shaped their own theology and faith in profound ways. Uh, that was a picture, uh, uh, show a slide of uh, St. Saint, Saint Andrew's Church. This is the church that John was baptized in, and, and later uh, the church his father served, and later John preached uh, many sermons from his father's grave outside that church. Right next to the church is the rectory. The next slide. This is, uh, this is the parsonage. This is where John grew up. This is the, about the third time it was been built, but it looked about this every time. When John was about five years old, and one of the times when the church was burned, uh, it, all the children were outside and the whole family was out except they didn't know where John was and they couldn't find him. And finally they found him. They saw him uh, uh, yelling out the second floor window. And uh, there's some great drawings of uh, a young man of the church got another young man and put him upon his shoulders and they rescued John from the flames at, at the age of five. And his mother, Susanna, told him at that time, John, you are a brand plucked from the burning. And John took that in, and, and Susanna in him recognized that poss quite possibly God had saved him in this moment for a very special 
place in history. And John always uh, remembered that experience. Susanna herself was a woman of discipline. She was the standard of motherhood for her time. All her children were allowed to cry until the age of one. And then that's it. And she was pretty effective at that discipline. As soon as they could talk, they were instructed to memorize the Lord's Prayer. There was no formal education until the age of five. But then at the age of five, the day they turned five, they had six hours of formal education and expected by the end of the day to know the ABCs. She gave them a classical education where they learned Latin and Greek. And she made sure, like, every, like your mother made you drink a glass of orange juice every morning, she made sure, like a good mother would, that they drank a glass of beer every morning. Because the hops were, she believed the hops were very good for her children. So some of you make awesome Methodists. Okay. All right. Uh, the, uh, uh, it was in the kitchen of this rectory, it was in the kitchen that she taught school, and she spent two hours a day under her apron in prayer. She conducted Bible study for the children every Sunday afternoon as she led them in Bible study. And one, on one occasion, she was... Uh, she was, uh, her husband was gone for about a year on business in London, so she was raising all the kids at home. And her husband put in his place at the rectory an associate pastor who frankly was quite boring. And the church members lost interest in going to church. And so they found out that Susanna was conducting Bible studies on Sunday in, in the afternoon in, in her kitchen. And so what started as 20 folks dropping in on this Bible study, eventually 200 people showed up in her kitchen just to hear her teach and preach. She would read sermons of her, of her father's or of her husband's and expound on them. Uh, she had charisma. Uh, I, wanted to, I wanted to tell you about that story because uh, her husband didn't appreciate this. And so I wanted to share a little bit of that conflict. She's, this new vet venture caused a stir in Epworth and some friction between Susanna and her husband. Samuel liked the theory, but not the practice. He objected to these home meetings because they were led by a woman. It might cause him some embarrassment and would be, it would be seen by some as con convent conventicle, a private, separate religious gathering. You know, it's quite possible that the, that the associate pastor could see this as some sort of separate separatist movement. And so, but Susanna defended herself in two masterful letters to her husband. She noted that attendance at the church services had jumped dramatically due to her meetings despite the opposition of Mr. Inman, Wesley's assistant. And so she wrote to her husband, this one thing has brought more people to the church than ever anything did in so short a time. We used not to have about 20 or 35 at evening service, whereas now we have between two and 300 which are more than ever came to hear Mr. Inman in the morning. Besides that, the constant attendance of the public worship of God, our meeting with, has wonderfully conciliated the minds of the people towards us. Remember, the people didn't particularly like the Wesleys, but now the people were beginning to really like her. She said, so that we, we now live in the greatest amnesty imaginable. And what is still better, they are very much reformed in their behavior on the Lord's Day. And those who used to be playing in the streets now come to hear a good sermon read, which is surely more acceptable to Almighty God. Another reason for what I do is that I have no other way of conversing with this people, and therefore I have no other way, no other way of doing them good. But by this I have an opportunity of, of exercising the greatest and noblest charity, that is, charity to their souls. And then she warned her husband, I need not tell you the consequences if you determine to put an end to our meeting. I can, know, I can now keep the people to the church, but if it be laid aside, I doubt they'll ever go to hear Mr. Inman. If you do, after all, think fit to dissolve this assembly, do not tell me that you desire me to do it, for that will not satisfy my conscience, but send me your positive command in such full and express terms as I may be absolved of all guilt and punishment when we meet our, we meet our great maker at the, awful, at the awful tribunal of our Lord Jesus Christ. So in other words, you said, if you don't let me keep meeting, then their souls are on your hands, on your conscience, and you'll have to face the maker and tell them why you dissolved this this meeting. So she was also a woman of very strong ways. Uh, what else can I tell you about her? This, this is what I want you to hear. It's because she had so many children, when she was, when she, uh, she, she decided that she wanted to spend one hour a week with each of her children to inquire of their souls. One hour a week with each of her children to inquire of their souls. She set a day aside for John, a day aside for Charles and, the sis and their sisters, each one getting an hour. And she would say this, she would meet with each child and say this, tell me, Jackie, that's what she called John. Tell me, Jackie, are you praying? Are you reading the scripture? What is God saying to you? 
What are you struggling with? It was a time that each child got personal attention to learn about the faith, to be mentored, and to ask the questions of faith. And later, when John and Charles began to codify the Methodist movement, they also asked their people to meet once a week in small groups and, and inquire about one another's soul. How is it with your soul? Tell me, brother, are you praying? Are you reading the scripture? What is God saying to you? Where did they get that from? They got it from their mother. As the children grew up, they would exchange letters with their mom, and she would counsel them on issues of theology, even while they were uh, well into adulthood in practical ministry. And one, one such occasion, uh, John, John uh, as the Methodist movement began to progress, uh, he, he found he was preaching on the streets, and he found himself banned from a lot of Anglican pulpits because they, they thought it was vile for, for an English priest to be out in the streets preaching. And so he, developed, he raised up preaching houses where he could go and preach from town to town into these houses as people would gather to hear him speak. But because he was so busy circuit riding and so busy traveling, he, he needed leadership in those preaching houses. And so he appointed laity, lay men and women, to be, to be the leaders. And on one such occasion, one of the lay ministers... Uh, moved beyond leadership, and he began preaching. He went from leader to preacher. And this seemed not right with John. I mean, because he's not ordained. He's not trained in the Scripture. Should, should, he, be, should he be doing this? And, and so it troubled him, and he was, about to, he was thinking about letting this guy go, firing him, let it, uh, asking him to step down. But at first he went to his mom. And he went to Susanna, and, he's, and she says, What's troubling you, Jackie? And he said, you know, uh, what did he say? He said, Thomas Maxfield has turned a preacher. And to this, Mrs. Wesley responded, You know what my sentiments have been. You cannot suspect me of favoring readily anything of this kind. But take care what you do with respect to that young man. For he is as surely called of God to preach as you are. Examine what have been the points of his preaching and hear him for yourself. So she told, she told John, Go and listen to the guy before you dismiss him and see if he's not called of God. And so John did just that. And when he did, he wrote in his journal, he said, It is the Lord. Let him do what seemeth him good. Who am I that I should withstand God? So I want you to hear this. Because of, because of Susanna, his w wisdom and discipline, and the way she led her own children, the way she influenced their, shaped their faith, and the way she uh, influenced John even well into adulthood, the Methodist revival was able to spread. It would not have spread with John alone, but it wasn't until that moment, until she, she allowed him to release lay preachers. And the lay, lay preachers, not, not ordained preachers, are what really got the Methodist movement going. And not just lay male preachers, but because of the influence of his mom, women lay preachers. Something that nobody else was doing and something that was essential, a precursor to the Methodist revival. When I, uh, 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 somebody asked Charles Wesley, John's brother, he asked, asked him this, what do you think was the most important factor that led to your conversion? Now I want you to know something about Charles before I give you his answer. Charles himself was a well-educated man, highly trained and skilled. He wrote over 6,000 6, hymns, many of, uh, many of them we sing. We sang today, Love Divine, All Love's Excelling, Hark the Herald Angels Sing, Oh, for a Thousand Tongues to Sing. He was a well-educated man, and he understood the process of God's salvation and how conversion works in the life of the believer. And he embraced the West, John Wesley's own theology in this, and when, when John would develop his theology, he would write a hymn about it. So, when, so you would think, when he was asked, what do you think was the most important factor that led to your conversion? It would be some huge theological treatise, but instead it was this. My mom's prayers. That's what led to my conversion. And I'm reminded of the scripture text that, that our children are reading in Kids Connection I'd like to read for you today. It comes from 2 Timothy. Paul writes to, to Timothy, his son in the faith. He says, I'm grateful to God whom I worship with a clear conscience, as my ancestors did, when I remember you constantly in my prayers night and day. Recalling your tears, I long to see you that I may be filled with joy. And then listen to this. He says this. I'm reminded of your sincere faith, a faith that lived first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and now I'm sure lives in you. You see, a precursor for revival for most people, for people like you and I, is, is a parent or grandparent who's been praying for us. Right? That's what leads to our conversion. Who has tried, who has, who has tried to share their faith with you in your own life? Who has modeled Christian living for you? Who has gone to their knees in prayer for you? 
I asked that question on Facebook this week. I said, are there any mothers and grandmothers who have influenced your faith? And some people responded. I'd like to hear what some of the people in our church said. This is what uh, Dee, Dee Maddox says about her own grandmother. She says, what I remember most about my granny was she and Gramps would read the Bible every evening after all was done. When I would spend the night, I would lay and listen to her, to her pray for each person she loved and cared deeply about. Sophie Djokovic, who was just up here singing with her kids, uh, she says this, My father left his home at 12 years old to be in the seminary. His experience was sour, and, and at 20 years old he decided to quit, and he went into the world, and he met, his mother, uh, met, met her mother and got married. Growing up, he never talked about religion. But my grandmother on my mother's side was living with us and taking care of us. She was a churchgoer, and I remember walking a mile from our house when, with her, already in her 70s, to go to church on Sundays. I never talked about this to anyone, and my parents never went with us. But she was a great influence and a role model to me. And later on in life, when I was an adult, I realized that other people in my family were going to church too, aunts and uncles, but they never said a word about it. When a close friend of my aunt got deadly sick with cancer, I started to go into church with my family again, and I realized that half my family was there too. Now when we see each other in Florida, we go to church together on Easter, even though they don't speak a word of English. Erin Anderson writes about her own grandma. She says, My grandma on my dad's side was an enormous religious influence for me. She took me to church with her when I would spend the weekend with them, and, and I vividly remember memorizing the books of the Bible with her, and when when I was spending the, the night with them. Actually, I just talked about her, about all of this, because our kids' connection, Aaron teaches Sunday school, is learning about Timothy and how his mother and grandmother influenced his faith. She couldn't recall the memories that I had, but was honored that I had remembered them. My grandma was always and still is very active in church, and I grew up thinking, this is what a good Christian do. But she always stressed to me the importance of her relationship with Jesus. It's not enough just to go to church. You have to have a relationship with the Lord. Corey, Corey Munt wrote about her grandmother and said, My grandma, grandma Eichen was my favorite person in the whole wide world. She was the most loving, patient, hardworking, and faithful person I've ever known. That all came from her relationship with the Lord. She had struggles she faced just like everyone else, but it was the way she faced them in everyday life that is such an inspiration to me. Grace and assurance in the Lord were her daily practice. When I read that word daily, I was struck because it reminded me of what Paul just wrote in his letter to Timothy about his own parents. He said, he said I'm, re I'm reminded of the sincere faith that lived, that lived first in your grandmother Lois, not visited. It didn't visit your grandmother Lois. It didn't, it didn't stop by on occasion, but the sincere faith that lived, that lived, that dwelt, that resided in your grandmother Lois. It's the kind of faith, the kind of faith that, that, uh, that uh, brings someone under an apron for two hours a day. Those, those, that kind of faith is what influenced Timothy. The kind of faith that lives. doesn't just visit on Easter and Christmas, but a living and dwelling faith. That's important for us to understand. Uh, there's a... Uh, uh, a, a great, uh, there's a great professor at Princeton University, her name is Kendra Creasy Dean, and she's been uh, looking at, uh, hold on, I just I want to make sure I didn't jump ahead of myself. Yeah, she's been, she's been looking at uh, faith of the next generation. She, she examines youth ministries and the children, the children, the youth, the next generation of, uh, of people, and are they, are they embracing the faith of their parents? So she examines this question, and at the end of her, her research, she says, I got good news and I got bad news. The good news is this, the next generation and the generations after that, they are receiving the faith of their parents and their grandparents. Here's the bad news. Their faith sucks. And that's the faith we're passing on. I'm sorry about that word. But, but that's the, the point she wants to make is this. We do pass on our faith. The question is, what faith are we passing on? Is it, is it one where, where God just makes a visit? Or is it one where, where, where the faith that lives in us? Is that the faith we're passing on? Does your faith live in you in such a way that your children's faith have half a chance? In the same way that Timothy's mom and grandmother lives in them. I, 
You know, I'd like to think about my own faith like my own, my own decision to love Jesus. And I like to think that maybe I made an independent decision in isolation of everything. You know, I examined the evidence. I, I, was, I, I was of age now to think for myself, and I made a decision that I'm going to love Jesus. But the reality is, I love Jesus because my mom and dad love Jesus. Right? And, and they love Jesus because their mom and dads love Jesus. I mean, this, this is how faith is passed on. Yeah, I made some decisions for myself, but it was, it was essential, you know, that I learned, I learned about the love of Jesus from my own parents. You know, every Saturday night, I would go roller skating. And we, I would stay there until 11.30 until the place closed down, but that meant that Sunday morning was really hard to get up. And so not only did my parents show me the love of God, they would show me the wrath of God on Sunday morning. <laughs> right? But both are vital. I, I, I'm so thankful I'm so thankful for the faith of, those who, of the generations ahead of me because those are the ones that have shaped my own. Jeff Adams puts it this way when he talks about his own mother on Facebook. He said, when, when the energy crises of the 70s hit, there were times when we walked to church when it was quite cold out. Teens and zero temps. The bottom line was I was going to church. I appreciate that perseverance and insistence. My mother took care to see that I was born and raised healthy. Why would she not see to it that it lasted eternally? If a precursor to revival is a parent or grandparent praying for you, then it begs the question, are we in prayer and modeling the faith for the generation beneath us? Do we pray for our children, our grandchildren? Do we pray for our nieces and nephews that they might be awakened to God? Do we see to their religious instruction are we intentionally meeting with them and inquiring, how is it with your soul, Jackie? What is God saying to you, son? Or maybe more importantly, do they catch us tending to, our own, say, tending to our own soul? Do they see us hiding under the apron and attending to our faith? I don't know how many times Kelly Rivers has told me that she sees that every time the church doors are open that Dell and Betty, her grandparents, are here. Don't tell me that didn't influence her own decision to love Jesus influences us. No matter how old we are, it influences us. As a parent or grandparent or an aunt or an uncle, what are you doing to inquire methodically about what God is doing in the lives of your children, your nieces and nephews or grandchildren? No matter what their age, maybe you need to start by inquiring about what God's doing in your own soul. But it's not too late. It's not too late to shape the faith of your children no matter their age. Do you hear what I said? It's not too late to shape the faith of your children, no matter their age. Close with one story. This week we've been praying for Stacy's Uncle Bud. Now Uncle Bud's a stubborn cotton farmer from West Texas. And uh, he's, he's uh, uh, received a cancer diagnosis. He went to the hospital with a mass on his lungs. And uh, so things are not looking well. His, his family, uh, every member of his family has died of cancer. And this is very serious and scary. But Stacy's sister, who, who lives close to him, uh, went to church last Sunday and told, uh, told her uh, husband's family, who also go to church with them, Stacy's sister married an African-American man, and her husband's parents are African-American. And, uh, and, uh, and even though uh, Bud, is a, Bud has been a steady Christian example in Stacy's life throughout her life, uh, but a quiet one because he's a West Texas cotton farmer, but her sister's in-laws are African-American and not so quiet. You get the culture mix here, right? And they, they decided, well, we're going, we're going to Uncle Bud's hospital bedside. And they went last week to his bedside, and they, uh, they said, and he was kind of surprised to see them. I mean, they're in-laws and not even, like, parents-in-laws. He's an uncle-in-law, and you know, just not. But they were insisted on going, and they said, Bud, we're, gonna, we're here to sing over you and pray for you. And so uh, he... Uh, he, he rips off the blankets and uh, steps, steps off. He's got his white, his white farm legs and his uh, beer belly and his John Deere hat on and his hospital gown and with the backside open. And he, and he steps out of bed and he, and he joined. And they said, what are you doing? We're here to sing and pray for you. He said, well, I got to stand for this. And, uh, and they begin to pray for him. And, Bud ha and then they begin to sing. And I wanted just to let you know that Bud has never sung a hymn in his life. 
He's just not that kind of guy. But they sang, and when it got to the chorus, Bud began to sing. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, oh my soul. And this quiet, the quiet faith of a West Texas farmer begins to sing with some other people of another older generation. And I just want to let you know this. Don't think that that doesn't witness to the, their 45-year-old niece named Stacy Vanderwerf. You see, the faith of the generations above us still witness to us. Still witness to us, no matter what the age of the children, whether they're your children or just people of another generation, you are ministering to them in your continual methodical pursuit of attending to your own soul and attending to the souls of others. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I give you thanks for Sophie Djokovic's grandmother. Because of her, we've got to see two young, beautiful children sing a song this morning. We've got to see the faith passed down through the generations. God, help us to be that kind of person that methodically models an attentiveness to what is most important in our life, our love for Jesus. Amen.